morning. I, I was rushing around a bit today, so if I didn't get a chance to meet you yet, my name is Chrissy, uh, and I'm one of the pastors here at Beacon Church, so you're very welcome, it's good to have you with us, and welcome again to Naraj. I did get to have lunch uh, with Naraj uh, on Friday, so I had a little bit of a, a preview ahead of time that was very nice to catch up and, and hear a bit what's happening. And it's an ideal time, actually. Naraj wouldn't have known it. We didn't know when we were planning, but we're talking about generosity. And to be honest with you, I was watching those pictures thinking, Naraj and his team there, they're showing, demonstrating generosity, aren't they? In caring for the people in their community. We've had a really good illustration this morning to help fuel our imaginations of what God wants to say to us about generosity. So we're in the third week of the series. So if this is your first week, don't worry, but I won't hold you accountable for what we said last week. Uh, but for those of you who were here, um, my question for you is, I'm looking at uh, notes from a couple weeks ago and thought, what does that mean? Uh, my question for you is how many of you, you don't need to answer, this is a rhetorical question, but I wonder how many of you had an opportunity to be generous this week that you intentionally took don't, you don't need to answer. I can tell you I had this conversation recently with some friends and, uh, and all of us, but, but they, you know, they said, well, Chrissy, I've got to be honest with you, I didn't even think about it. And some of us will be in that category. And I, this is not to make anyone feel guilty or feel bad because it's called practicing the way. They're spiritual practices. So this is about learning how to do something. Practice is about learning how to do something. And I start with that question because I've become aware, actually, if we, you know, we've done, this is our fourth uh, um, uh, spiritual practice that we've looked at. So we've looked at Sabbath and fasting and prayer. And if I asked you, well, how do you, how do you practice fasting and prayer? Well, would you pull out your diary, wouldn't you? And you say, oh, well, I'd plan it in. And I wonder how many of us, I was struck when I had that conversation with friends, do we plan to be generous? Or do we just think it'll happen, we'll sort of just walk along and, oh, this is a moment. Perhaps part of making this a spiritual practice, something that develops in us an opportunity to learn to be more like Jesus, our generosity needs to be as intentional as our set-aside time for prayer or a set-aside time for fasting. That actually our generosity isn't going to happen by accident. We're not going to stumble and fall and be, oh, I accidentally was generous this week. Maybe we need to, to plan our generosity. But I want to begin with a question. How do you care for something that doesn't belong to you? This thing, but how do you care for something that doesn't belong to you? Chris and Sue were laughing because I take it permission. Uh, uh, we were chit-chatting, and as we were, talk as we were talking, I said, this would work so well with my sermon. Can I use this? So you might remember, if it, I don't know when it was. It would have been a few weeks back now. Uh, Chris preached a sermon, and he told a story about his dog, Abby, and really about Sue, which I assume he had permission to tell. Uh, and he took, some of you will remember, if you don't, the, the, the contours of the story are, uh, when they're children, they have four children, and when they were very young, Sue would hurry off uh, to, before work and before school up to the castle to take sweet Abby for a walk. And as dogs do, she didn't always come back as promptly as necessary. And Sue, being the pragmatic, practical woman that she is, said, well, I've got to get to work. I've got to get the kids to school. So she would leave the dog at the castle. She'd run home, get the kids off to school and do what she needs to do. And then she'd go back to the castle, I don't know how long later, an hour or so later maybe. And the dog would often be there with the little... Um, the little hut, hut thing where the person who looks after it might be living and they'd have a bowl of water and say, oh yeah, your dog's here waiting for you. Now, I, we were chatting about this at the weekend because this coming week I'm going to be in London for lectures for the um, doctoral course that I've started. Don't ask me how it's going. It's going stressfully as how it's going. <laughs> but, and Chris and Sue have very kindly said they'll keep my dog for me. And so this conversation came up because I said, um, you know, Kat's doing this and that. He's very good. I said, what? One comment I've just been thinking about since Chris told this story. Um, I don't think Cap will do so well if you just leave him at the castle. <laughs> I think maybe you should just bring him home with you when you leave. Now, and she said, of course not, of course not. And I sort of not. I said, no, I know you wouldn't. But I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> Cover all my bases, right? But of course not. And of course, I, I really didn't need to say it. Because we treat, if you are looking at 
after someone else's dog, you don't do what you would do. What would you? You don't. You stop and think, well, what would Chrissy want me to do? Well, Chrissy, Chrissy wouldn't leave her dog there. She'd be too terrified that the wolves would get out. Are there even wolves in town? <laughs> <laughs> the wolves are in a different town, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> but there was this sense of how do we care for things that don't belong to us, whether it's children or pets or homes or whatever. We don't treat them the same, do we? You think about it in a different way. Some of you are nodding because you're like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, here's the thing. Our money doesn't belong to us. Our houses and our cars and every single thing that we own belongs to God. But we don't often think about our money the way we would thinking about looking after someone's pets. And yet we are just stewards. More than half of Jesus' parables in the Bible are all about stewardship. And yet I would guess that most of us, like just that, I'm sure for me, when I was thinking about this, it was like a light bulb of like, yeah, I have never once, the thought process that goes into looking after someone's dog or someone's children, you know, that thought process of this isn't mine, I don't think I use that same, I'm talking about myself, I'm sure you guys could teach me some things, but for myself, I don't think that I often look at those things with that same mindset. So this morning, we're gonna try, if we can, to unpick our mindset around money and think a little bit about how stewardship or this idea of being a caretaker of something that doesn't belong to us, how that might affect the way we look at the things that we have and allow us to be more generous. So we're gonna look at Luke chapter 12. Uh, if you want to try to key it in, it's Luke chapter 12, 35 to 48, but I won't read it immediately. Luke 12, 35 to 48 is what we're gonna look at. But actually Luke chapter 12 from verses 13 to 48 is one of the longest teachings in the Bible that Jesus gives about money. We're not gonna look at it all today. Uh, but right in the middle of this long teaching from Jesus on money, verse 33, Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. And on either side of this are two parables. So in verse 13, if you've got one of these Beacon Bibles, or depending if you've probably got an NIV, they're probably all similar. Verse 13, there's that little heading. It says the parable of the rich fool. So that's next week. You've got a, And then on the other end, Verse 35, which is what we're going to look at today, it says watchfulness, but actually there's a parable in here of a wise manager, of a faithful servant. So there are these two contrasting parables about money, and it's helpful to know, I'm stressing this, because when you read this, you're going to be like, this is about money? This is about money. This is about stewardship, and you can see it because of the context. Because Jesus is all in here. He's talking about the parable of the rich fool. He's talking about not worrying about what you have. He's talking about selling your possessions. And then immediately he goes into another parable, another story, to give an example of what does it look like to be a good steward of what you've been given. So that's what we're going to look at for a moment. So Luke chapter 12, uh, from verse 35 to 48. Let's read it together. It says, Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks they can immediately open the door for him it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes truly i tell you he will dress himself to serve he will make them recline at the table and will come and wait on them it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us, or is it for everyone? Good question, Peter. And the Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager? I don't know about you, but I'm like, you didn't answer the question. Uh, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But su suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. 
The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few, few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And you're thinking, this feels like a riddle, <laughs> see, maybe. How is this about stewardship? So let's just walk through this very briefly, but just to try to understand what is Jesus saying? Why is this the example he gives? So if <clears throat> he begins in verse 35, identifying that this is a story about people who are serving a master, a rich master. If you've got multiple servants, you're probably doing okay. This is like Downton Abbey vibes, right? Uh, so this master is owning a house and he leaves his possessions to his servants and says, I want you to look after it, right? So we, we have here, there's stewardship here, right? There's looking after what doesn't belong to you. And it begins by saying it needs to start with alertness, right? Be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. It talks about lots here about watchfulness. There's a sense in which what the master expects is don't waste what belongs to me. How many of us have gotten to the end of the day and thought, where's the time? What did I even do today? Have you ever done that? No criticism. I'm just asking. Have you ever experienced that? I've done that driving home before. I don't remember getting here. That's a bit scary, right? You've gotten to the end of the week and think, what did I even accomplish this week? What did I finish this week? Maybe you get to the end of the month and you think, where's my money gone this month? What did I, like, why, why, am I, why is the bank account here? What did I even get? Why am I running out? Have you had this? This sense of the life around us is filled with distraction. Some of us, I have to, I have to teach, discipline myself. I wasn't good this weekend, so maybe that's why it's on my mind. But like, normally I discipline myself to not eat while I'm watching television. But we all know what happens. It's like carnage. You look down and you're like, oh, surely, surely I didn't do that. Surely, what happened? I, I barely had a bite. It's the distraction, isn't it? It's the lack of awareness and alertness. And yet Jesus begins this conversation around stewardship and says, you've got things that belong to you. My expectation when I give my lovely, really naughty puppy to Chris and Sue is they're not just going to let him run off and be like, oh, yeah, I have no idea. Where I wasn't paying any attention at all. I hope he didn't get eaten, right? Of course not. Your expectation is alertness, watchfulness. Yes, I, I know where it is. Uh, Sue's lovely because she will send me, she'll, uh, she's once or twice she's watching the dog, watch the dog for me, and she'll send me like photo updates. I sometimes feel, I never tell anyone because I'm like, people are gonna think I'm that mom, you know? Like, I'm like, I, like it's a child or something and I need it. And here he's had a nap, and here he ate his food, and he went on a walk. And like, I get, I get updates all day long, like he's gone to preschool, you know, it's lovely. Uh, I don't know what he does when I'm not there, but I know what he does when he's with safe. But that's alert, isn't it? It's watchful. It's saying, actually, I'm paying attention to what you have entrusted to me. And the time is not just slipping by. It's not just slipping through my fingers unnoticed and, and unintentionally. That's where this conversation begins. Then in verse 37, we get this, this little look at the master coming home. The servants are ready. And interestingly, we learn some things about who this master is. Obviously, we know that he's wealthy. He's got servants. But we're told this master comes home and he takes off his clothes, he puts on his work clothes, and he begins to serve the servants. So even though this master is someone who has an expectation of how his things are looked after when he's not there, our understanding, what we're meant to know about the master, this is, this is representing who God is, right, in this parable, is that he's generous, that he's a servant, that he's not this harsh task, taskmaster. But that actually, he says, I want you to care for things because when I come, I'm going to care for you. Right? This is, he's, he's, he's demonstrating a character of generosity. Then verses 38 to 41, we get this whole exchange. If you knew a thief was coming at midnight, you'd be awake at midnight waiting with a bat. You wouldn't let your house get broken into. And, and again, it's all this stuff 
about watchfulness. And he says, watch and be ready. And I think those two, he's saying two different things here. Watch so that you don't become greedy, right? When I sit on the sofa and I have the sharing bag of crisps, if I don't watch, I can unintentionally, through distraction, become greedy. It's just, it's quite a simple, but it is what it is. But if you watch, you say, no, actually, I'm just going to take this amount, I'm going to put it in a bowl, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to enjoy my snack, and I'm going to put it away, like normal people do, right? <laughs> you are paying attention to what's going in. Watch, because if you don't watch, you may, through distraction, become greedy. You may, because you're watching the television and seeing the adverts, because you're driving, uh, f you know, whatever on the phone, and the, you know, and it like knows your thoughts, and this is the thing you want to buy. And through distractions, ping, 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 buy this, buy that, you need this, your life is through distraction. If you're not watchful, you may become greedy. So watch and be ready, ready to act, ready to act with generosity. And what does that look like? So verse 42 to the end, he then describes in this parable, avoiding greediness, but alert and aware, these are not my possessions, I'm looking after them for my master, and how can I take opportunity? And what does he say, verse 42, that he wants you to do with them? Well, he says that the wise manager is the one who gives food, uh, who, who is in charge of the servants and gives them their food allowance at the proper time. The wise manager is the one who looks after the people who belong to the master. You see this? The one who's being alert, who's avoiding greediness, says, these resources have been given to me for the sake of the master's people. And I need to look after those people. And I've been entrusted. Here's the food. Here's the clothing. Here's the housing. Here's what all my people need. And I'm giving it you to make sure that each person has what they need from what I've given you. That's what I've entrusted to you. The unwise manager is the one who says, well, I don't know when they're coming back. And look at what I've got. I'm throwing a party. And I'm going to eat all the food. And I'm going to drink all the more I eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. So I might as well enjoy it while I have it, because it's for me, rather than being entrusted for the sake of others. This is the story Jesus tells. So, very quickly, uh, very quickly, I want to just pull out what are three things that we can learn from this story about Jesus's view of, of money or of generosity. Three things. The first thing I think is obvious, but the first thing is that all of it belongs to God. We are just caretakers or stewards. So when God gives us something, we often say, oh, God's given us this. It's a blessing. It's a gift. I think it's better that we understand it not as a Christmas gift, but as the kind of gift you get when you're, you know, if I ever get the gift of babysitting sweet Marcus. His mother is giving me the gift of, here's my baby, not giving me the gift of, you can have him now forever. <laughs> I'm just looking after him for a little while. If I think, oh, thank you for giving me your baby, I'm going to America to visit my mom and show you the gift you've given me, I think that's called kidnapping. <laughs> Some of us have been kidnapping Jesus' money. He's given us a gift, and we've unwrapped it like it's a Christmas gift. It's all mine. And instead, he's entrusted to us something precious and says, I want you to look after it better than you might even look after your own. I want you to look after it as if, as if I'm looking after it, because I'll be back one day and I'll want it back. It's not yours forever. Do you see this? And if we're not looking, if we're looking after it more like it's a Christmas gift rather than a babysitting gift, we might end up stealing something that doesn't belong to us. It all belongs to God. The second thing I think we learn about Jesus's view of money is that we have been entrusted with resources to do good. That God gives us his resources. So the question that we, you know, uh, my expectation is, so I sometimes look after uh, the Harris's dog, Buddy. Lots of us know Buddy. Um, and when I have Buddy, the question that I ask is, well, what would Alex do? Which, quite frankly, is not lots, so it's quite easy. But or when you're babysitting, 
What do you do whenever you turn up to, to look after someone's kids? I've been, I'm a serial babysitter. Uh, and whenever you're babysitting, particularly at bedtime, they're still little, what do you do? You sit down, usually with mom, and if she's not already written a list of things, then you say, all right, what happens at bedtime? Oh, they need, and there's an order of things, isn't there? And they'll sleep best, they need three stories and two glasses of milk, and then one more story, and then brush their teeth, and then the toilet, and then a story, and then the toilet, and then they'll sleep. You know? <laughs> right? it's, like a, it's like a code for a video game, how do you get the cheat code, you know? But you don't come in and say, oh, well, this is my kid. I'm gonna, no, you say, I'm going to do this the way the parent would do because this one doesn't belong to me. I'm just looking after. I'm just the caretaker for a short time. So how would mom or dad look after this child? What do I do with it in this moment? God has entrusted things to us. And I think our question with what we own, with our money, with our resources, our homes, our time, all of these things. The question is, this doesn't belong to me, so I need to consider with what I've been entrusted. Let me be clear with that. With what I have been entrusted, not with what Chris has been entrusted or Naraj has been entrusted or with Margaret or Ian. I'm responsible for what I have. So what it looks like for me to be generous will be different than what it looks like for Mary Campbell to be generous. Actually, we're a bit similar, Mary. We might be on the same path, right? We, we are entrusted, so what does it look like with what I have? I literally thought last night, so I was reflecting on this and writing it into my little book, that's the last step of my sermon prep, and I sat there last night and looked around and I thought, you know what would be really useful for me is to sit in my living room on my sofa and look around at the beautiful home that I have been entrusted with for this season and say, if Jesus sat in this house, and he had my bank account, and he had this house, and this car, and this amount of time, what would Jesus do with this time to bless the people he knows? I was really struck by that. It was late last night, but I was struck by sitting there thinking, this is what I have. And what I have is more than many and less than some. But this is what I have. And if Jesus sat where I'm sitting, if he stood in this space, he's probably just here, what would he do with what's been given to him to care for the people around him? And in case some of you don't know me, because some of you don't, I want to be clear, I'm not asking for your money for the church. I'm asking how will you care for the people who belong to God? They all belong to him in case you're wondering. What would he do if he sat in my seat? That is the question. That's what it means that we've been entrusted with resources to do good. The third thing to learn, so all of it belongs to God. Uh, we've been entrusted with resources to do good. And the third thing is God blesses us so that we can give more, not have more. So there's an unhelpful, uh, but there's a lot of this teaching in some churches and some lines of thought around a prosperity gospel. This idea that the Bible says, if you give money, God will bless you. Just send me five pounds a month and you'll get a Ferrari or something. Right? Now the problem with this is, as with most lies from Satan, is it's not 100% untrue. It's a half-truth. So I'm just going to quickly read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 to 11. If you want to read along, you can, but just so you know where it is in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul's writing to a group of Christians about their giving, and this is what he says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Multiple times in this passage, Paul says, if you give, if you're generous, God will bless you. That's a half truth. There is truth in that. However, Twice, and I'll point it out in verse 11, he says, you will be enriched in every way. And then these two inconvenient words, so that. So that you will be enriched in every way. So that 
You can be generous on every occasion. You see, the principle that Jesus teaches us about generosity is yes, the more, the more that you give, the more that you will be blessed. But you are not blessed so that you can have it. You are blessed so that you can continue to be generous. What God says is, you are a trustworthy steward. You are a wise manager. So I can give you more because I know that you will make sure that my people are looked after. So it's safe. My money is safe in your hands. So I can bless you with more of it. And yes, some of that doesn't mean that we won't experience any blessing as a result of that. Not every penny that comes immediately goes out, but much of it does. There's a principle here. If our generosity is driven by getting blessing from God, it's not actually generosity. It's generosity driven by a heart of greed. There's still greed in there. I'm giving this so that God will bless me and give me what I want. You don't get to make those kind of deals with God. God, I'll give XYZ to the church and you need to give me this. That's not how it works. We give a heart, right? It talks about the heart at the beginning. You give what God has prompted you to give to care for his people, whether those are his people in Nepal through the work that's happening there, whether it's the work that happens in a church, whether it's the work that happens through things like House of Breads, whether it's the work that happens in, in various mission or social action organizations, whether it's the work that happens because you live on a street and you know your neighbor is struggling. It's whatever way that God's people need to be cared for, we have been entrusted. And God blesses us, and the more that we're blessed, the more that we can give. So the real question, if I can be a little bit controversial, some of you will say, okay, Chrissy, we've been talking about generosity, and you're waiting for me to give you, like, the magic number. How much money am I supposed to give to the church? I warned you already, I'm not asking for your money for the church. You should give money to the church because God has prompted you to, not because I've manipulated you emotionally to feel like you should. You should give money to the work in Nepal because God has prompted you and moved you, not because someone has manipulated you to feel like you have to. Okay, so I want to be clear about that. But I'm gonna say something controversial. Often, in these kind of conversations, we land at the end and say, right, so the question I need to ask is how much should I give to God? I would like to suggest, with some fear and trepidation, that perhaps we're asking the wrong question. If all of this money belongs to God anyway, then perhaps the more appropriate question is how much should I keep? Now for some of you, you need to keep 98% because you need it to live and God doesn't want you to be destitute. Okay, don't mishear me. That's why I'm not giving the, you need to tithe 10%. Some of you shouldn't tithe 10% because that's not what God's been entrusted to you. And you wouldn't keep a roof over your head if you tithed 10%. But some of us could do more. And not necessarily only to church. Probably not only to church. But how much should you keep? This is a very random one, but honestly, these things, it's like when you preach about something, you can't escape it, it's just everywhere. Uh, there's, a, there's a makeup and skincare company in the States that I've over the years worked with off and on. And I just saw recently the CEO made an announcement. The company's been around for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And they've been successful. But they're, they're Christians who own it. And this man has come on and said, oh, my wife and I were not, uh, at the recent like conference they did, they said, my wife and I were not taking a salary anymore. We're not taking any more profits. And somebody queried it and said, yeah, but lots of CEOs, they stop taking a salary, but they get all the bonuses. And he said, no, no, every single penny from now in perpetuity, not for a year or two, for the rest of the life of this company, he said, God has blessed us. I feel like the, I was reading the press release. God has blessed us. We have been blessed by the company. We have made more than we could ever have imagined. And so from now, for the life of this company, as long as we are working here, any money that we would have gotten, 100% will go to a chair, to various charities. We are not taking it. That is a mentality of generosity that says, how much should I keep? How much is mine versus how much is God's? It's a different way of thinking about it, isn't it? And it won't be the same for all of us. So it's not a very helpful conversation with your friends because what someone else 
God has said won't be what he said to be. And that's, that's right, and that's good, and that's okay. So I'll finish with this. I wanted to finish something practical. How do you do it? How do you practice generosity? And I've written down five things. Number one, be intentional. You're not gonna trip and fall and be generous. Just like you don't trip and fall and, oh, I, I magically read my Bible every day this week. You practice it. You, you put it in your diary. You get up half an hour earlier. You be intentional. Number two, be consistent. Generosity does something in us it fills us with joy. It brings blessing to us. So don't wait once a year for Christmas and then say, oh, I'm going to, you know, be Santa. Be consistent. Number three, be realistic. You know, I have a friend. I go to Slimming World and I have a friend. And when they go around Slimming World, they ask, how much would you like to lose this week? And this lady, she is hilarious and I love her. And she says, four stone. I'd like to lose four stone. She's honest. You probably would like to. We wouldn't we all, right? But it's not realistic, is it? Probably not, probably not. So be realistic. And say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give away everything I have and I'm gonna be realistic. Number four, be sacrificial. That's the balance to being realistic. We can be realistic ourselves into greed, honestly. Be sacrificial. I had, um, this is the second week in a row where I've had people offer me money. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen this often. It is literally, I'm sure, because I'm preaching this series. I went to a conference, Chris was there, Ian was there, uh, and Chris and Ian will find this humorous because they were there. I got an email from a group of speakers list offering me an honorarium for my speaking. Now Chris and Ian know, <laughs> Ian's like, what? Exactly. I was on the stage for five minutes to give an interview about a book. I didn't speak. I was not a speaker. But they offered me an honorarium. Now I need to, I need to make sure you don't think I'm the hero of this story. I left that email in my inbox for two days and didn't answer. They weren't asking me if I wanted it. They were asking me for my bank details. Like I just had to say, Christina Remsburg, here's the numbers. And they would have given me, I don't know. And I knew they have a big grant to cover this event. It wouldn't have hurt them if they gave it to me. I am not, a, you know, Bill Gates. It wouldn't have bothered me to have received some money that I hadn't expected. And I left it for two days. And thought, Chrissy, you cannot preach about generosity. And remember, we've said generosity is sometimes about what you give, and sometimes it's about what you choose not to take, that you take what you need. And I thought, well, this isn't mine to take. So I did email back and said, no, I can't take this, you know, I don't know why I'm emotional, it wasn't emotional, but now, you know, I'm not a speaker, but thank you very much, you know, that's the end of it. Uh, and, and she wrote back, and I thought it was funny, the lady, this, she's an admin lady, and she wrote back and said, oh, thank you so much for your generosity. And my, and my inclination was, oh, I wasn't being generous. But again, I'm like, just that reminder, the Holy Spirit is saying, just so you know, I'm teaching you about generosity right now. Two days later, I had an unexpected expense come up, and I'm slightly stressed about thinking, I wish I took that honorary. <laughs> it needs to hurt a little, and I'm not, nobody in this room, if you give me money, I'm giving it back to you. I'm not telling the story so that you feel sorry for <laughs> me. Right, so... Because you'll steal my blessing. Giving needs to be sacrificial. Yeah, it needs to hurt a little bit. It costs me something. Sometimes I don't have enough to give extra, but when I say no to something I could receive, sometimes that's a sacrifice. So it needs to hurt a little. And number five, it needs to be joyful. God doesn't want grumpy money. So if you're grumpy about it, if you're frustrated about it, just keep it. Honestly, be joyful. Give what feels joyful to you that brings you joy. So here's my challenge for you. How are you going to put these things into practice? Maybe some of you need to take Chris's challenge last week more seriously and simplify. You can't be generous if you need every single penny and a few you don't have. So maybe we need to look at how do we create some margin. Margin with our time or margin with our resources, margin with our money. Maybe you need to simplify. Some of you need to know God better. How can you imagine what God would do with his money if you don't know anything about him or what his heart is like? Do you know who the master is? Do you know what kind of a generous God he is? Do you know what his heart breaks for? Maybe you need to know God better. For some of you just need to choose generosity as a practice. And you need to take those five things and say, I'm going to put these things into practice. Do something. Don't just come and listen to a sermon. I, I, I'm literally saying, do something. I can't tell you what. This is the worst ever. Do something. I can't tell you what, because it won't be the same for everyone. 
But I am imploring you, if you want to learn to be like Jesus, it is more than praying and fasting and reading your Bible. Those are important. Those are part of it. But generosity was at the heart of who Jesus was. He was generous to the point of pouring his blood out for us. He gave everything. Do something. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are good and you are gracious that you are generous with us beyond comprehension. God, I pray that you would stir our hearts, that some of us in this room have been stirred about uh, the stories and the work that's happening in Nepal. And for some of us, we need to have a conversation with Naraj because we want to learn more. Some of us, God, need to be stirred for the people that we pass on the street or in our community, or our friends or our family who we know. We have a responsibility of generosity to care for the people around us with what you have entrusted to us. God, I just pray that you would stir us, that you would teach us how do we consume less, take less, so that we can give more. Teach us, God, how to have hearts that are generous. And I pray over the people in this room, that every person in this room, God, who takes this seriously, who seeks over the next weeks and months to take generosity seriously, God, I pray that you would bless them in a way that, like me, they can say this can only be God, and they would recognize the work of your Spirit in response to their generosity, and that they would be blessed to continue to be a blessing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.